Good morning, everybody. Um, <clears throat> before I proceed, I would like to make a humble request to everybody, if you could able to kindly switch your mobile phone over the silent mode to avoid any interruption, please. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, please allow me to introduce myself. And I'm Tenzin Jomo, Program Coordinator of Tibet House, New Delhi. And on behalf of Tibet House Culture Center of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, would like to welcome and extend our warm welcome to our chief guest, uh, Venerable Professor Gishangao Samdila, <clears throat> Vice Chancellor, Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies, Varanasi, uh, our guest of honor, Professor Sumit Kumar Mishra, uh, Principal Scientist, National Physical Laboratory, New Delhi, and our keynote speaker, Professor Sisi Roy. Um, National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore, and our esteemed speakers and the vibrant participants who joined over here for the National Conference on Quantum Physics and for this philosophy on the ontological reality. Thank you very much. And now I would like to request our chief guest, Venerable Professor Geshen Awa Samtila, uh, our, our guest of honor, Professor Sumit Mishra Ji, and our keynote speaker, Professor Sisi Roy Ji, to kindly light the lamp of wisdom and request to take their respective seats on the dais, please. Thank you very much. And now I would like to request um, Mr. Tenzin Choktanlai to kindly offer the souvenirs and the kata to the uh, chief guest, Professor Geshe Ngao Samtila. Our guest of honor, Professor Sumit Kumar Mishraji. And our keynote speaker, Professor Sisi Royji. Thank you, Mr. Choknila. Tibet House continues to follow the vision of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama in organizing uh, different conferences and dialogue on quantum physics and Buddhist philosophy, neuroscience, and Buddhist psychology, wherein eminent scholars from various disciplines will share their valuable inputs and address the critical issues on quantum physics intersecting with Buddhist philosophy, psychology, with the contemplative understanding on Buddhist philosophy as well. And therefore, Tibet has organized the series of conferences and uh, dialogues annually. Before I proceed, I would like to give a brief introduction about Tibet House and its activities, Tibet House. Tibet House, New Delhi, was established in 1965 by His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet for the purpose of preserving the cultural heritage of Tibet at the time when it faced the extinction in its homeland, as well as for the providing a center for Tibetan culture and Buddhist studies. And His Holiness 14 Dalai Lama's recurring emphasis on developing a sense of universal harmony and compassion as its own effective antidote 
to global suffering together with the needs for a meaningful exchange between different religion, religious and culture tradition also had a profound effect on the purpose and its activities of Tibet House. Over the period of five decades since its inception, Tibet House has come to recognize as the significant institution for the dissemination of Tibetan culture and for the Buddhist studies. Okay, Tibet House has a museum for a purpose in His Holiness' word to bring the heritage of the past in close contact. <clears throat> Tibet House, a publication unit which publishes around 10 to 15 books a year and a program division which regularly organizes lectures, seminar, conferences, and film screenings and exhibitions. And since I've mentioned, Tibet House has a library and also had a very beautiful museum, as you can see it in the PowerPoint presentation. And now Tibet House also offer four different courses on Buddhist philosophy, psychology, and Tibetan language. Firstly, the first batch of Nalanda Master's course, which was launched on 9 December 2016 on the occasion of 51st anniversary of Tibet House, New Delhi, in the gracious presence of His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, along with Sri Kiran Rijuji, the former Union Minister of Home Affairs, and Sri Najib Jang, Lieutenant Governor of Delhi. And the first batch of Nalanda Master's course is completed with 372 students from 44 different countries. And now second batch of Nalanda Master's course on Buddhist, uh, Buddhist philosophy has already started in July, in which ni around 900 participants were enrolled from 54 different countries. And secondly, Nalinda Master's course, which was launched on 2018, and three, three batches have been successfully completed so far, and it is also a 14 months course. The course is designed specifically to accommodate people who are more seriously interested in Buddhist philosophy while being in the midst of their busy schedule, along with the engagement and other commitments. Till now, we have successfully completed with three batches, and the fourth batches of Nalinda Diploma Course Batch 4 is now being offered, and the registration will start in December of this year. And uh, very recently, we had a two-month Nalinda Certificate course, which was being offered to the student who wished to acquire knowledge of various Buddhist subject in order to lay a very good foundation of Nalinda Buddhist philosophy to find a very meaningful life as well. And during the lockdown, we could not able to attend on the offline basis and also in a regular basis. So we uh, organized these uh, studies in this form. So these are the pictures. Okay, lastly, Tibet House also offers Tibetan language course on a very regular basis. There are four different levels of learning offered at a very nominal fee with a special concession for the students and monastics. Until date, 23 batches have been successfully completed and for now, the 24th batch has been um, offered and which is being both online and offline, and the actual course will start from 1st December this year. Thank you very much. And now I would like to request Mr. Choktanla to kindly address the gathering. Uh, <clears throat> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it feels great to see an overwhelming number of audience here today. So on behalf of Culture Center, uh, Tibet House Culture Center of His Holiness the Dalai Lama uh, and the Director of Keshe Doji Damdol, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Keshe Ngao Samtenla, Vice Chancellor, uh, uh, 
Sorry. Central Institute of uh, High Tibetan Studies, Sarnath Varanasi, uh, guest of honor, Dr. Sumit Kumar Mishraji, principal scientist, CSIR National Physical Labor Laboratory, New Delhi, our keynote speaker, Professor Cecil Roy, National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. We're honored to have you here today, sir. I'm also pleased to be able to welcome all the distinguished speakers and participants, uh, those of you who have been with us for long, as well as those of you who are new. Our director, Mandubukishi Doji Tamdula, uh, sent his apologies for not being able to attend the conference today. Although, Mandubukishi Doji Tamdul was very much looking forward to this conference, but owing to his busy schedule uh, with numerous travels within India and abroad line up on his itinerary, he couldn't make it here today. Mandubukishi Doji Tamdula expresses his deep gratitude and thanks to all the guests and participants. So coming back to today's conference, the topic, quantum physics and Buddhist philosophy, is by far one of the most discussed dialogues between Buddhism and science. Uh, while on, one may say that there are many similarities between quantum physics and Buddhist philosophy, uh, there are times when these two traditions differ and therefore explore, further exploration is required. Now given that quantum physics is in the face of development, we very much look forward to uncovering the deeper layer in today's conference through conversation on ontological reality and see where the two traditions overlap and where the two traditions diverge. So without further ado, uh, I request our program coordinator to proceed with the event. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Shokhtanla. And now I would like to request Venerable Professor Geshe Ngao Samdala, Vice Chancellor of Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies, to kindly share the few words at the conference. Before I request Geshe La, I would like to uh, share a brief introduction about him. He's uh, currently the Vice Chancellor of Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies, Sarnath Waranasi, and he studied at the Central School for Tibetan in Chandigarh. Orissa, and thereafter at the Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies, Sarnath. He possesses a rare combination of education on the modern lines as well as the Tibetan monastic system. He obtained the Geshe Haramba degree from Gandhi Sharsa Monastery, equivalent to PhD degree in the modern system. He is also very actively engaged in Hindi translation of Buddhist text in Sanskrit and Tibetan. With a special interest in his in the philosophy of Nagarjuna, he published the definitive critical edition of the Ratnavali with its commentary as the result of his postgraduate research. And in 2009, he has been awarded Padma Shri, one of the country's highest civilian awards by the President of India for his distinguished service in the field of education and literature. Please. Round of applause to the Professor Geshe Ngao Samdala. Sarva Drishti Varhanai Sadhramam Adishat Anukampam Upadai Tam Gautamam Namami. Respected uh, Professor Sisi Raoji and uh, Professor Sumit uh, Mishraji and uh, distinguished uh, scientists and uh, philosophers and uh, friends. Uh, today we are at a very important juncture of the era where we stand. Physically, the world has shrunk into a village and civilizationally also because of that we come across many of the civilizations meet and this is one of the, uh, the event of that uh, meeting, meeting with the Western civilization and Eastern civilization particularly Indian and Buddhist uh, civilization and culture. As we can see, 
in India, the focus of exploration and advancement had been in India in ancient time, primarily on in inner world, not, not external world. That is why we don't find uh, lots of, you know, the developments and advancement in the physical world. Of course, we can see some after the uh, after the arrival of foreign rulers in India, otherwise we can see the civilizational kind of impact, a civilizational kind of you know the culture, uh, which had been primarily focusing on inner development, and uh, this is the hallmark of uh, Indian civilization. We can say in a way. And uh, industrializations and advancement of uh, the material world was not the part of the area where the great scholars of all the Indian philosophical schools and religious systems have uh, made. Rather, if we look into the inner structure and system of Indian civilization, then we get uh, the picture that uh, in ancient India, there was a very, very rich interaction amongst the Indian philosophical schools. Whereas you, can, you cannot see that kind of interaction in other civilizational kind of uh, domains. In India, there was a very, very strong interaction amongst the philosophical schools. I used to say that in order to have an idea about this rich interaction, we don't have to ask any historian. We can look into the texts, treatises written by the scholars, masters of respective schools. This may be Vedanta, Mimansa, Vaisheshika, Nayayika, Jaina, and uh, Buddhism. You can see very clearly, vividly, how this interaction took place, and then, uh, you know, uh, they were contributed, they have contributed to each other and collectively moved further. This is the beauty of that. Uh, ancient Indian civilization. And Nalanda, Vikramashila, Takshishila, these intellectual and learning centers have contributed a lot and they took a lead in that. Particularly in the field of philosophy, epistemology, and logic. Hence, we can see that uh, you know, because of this uh, interaction, how it advanced further and uh, how they respected each other. The sign of respecting other is to accept others' views and adopt it and then move forward. That, has, that took place in each of the philosophical systems. And till Nalanda Vikramashila disappeared from India, the tradition disappeared from India, India already had reached at a very, very sophisticated philosophical systems and intellectual systems in terms of epistemology and logic and many other disciplines. But uh, then on the other hand, we can see in the Western world this advancement in you know scientific uh, uh, world. This is also highly appreciable. We must appreciate that, uh, the contributions made by the scientists. But the difference between 
the Indian civilizational and intellectual advancement, the objective of Indian advancement of uh, uh, the, the science, particularly the science of mind, and the Western um, the science, the objectives, if we compare it, the objectives were very different. Whereas uh, the Indian civilizational kind of advancement is concerned, Acharya Nagarjuna has said that just in order to save time, I'm jumping, uh, you know, leaving many things in between. He has said in one of, uh, in, in his magnum opus, Mul uh, Madhimika Kharika, Karma Klesha, the Moksha, Karma Klesha Vikalpataha, Te Prabanchat, Prabanchastu, Shunyatayam, Nirudhyade, which means Karma Klesha, the Moksha, the karma and afflictions. Uh, when they are eliminated, the liberation can be achieved. And where from the karma klesha come? The karma kleshas come from vikalpataha, from uh, mental fabrication. And these mental fabrications, they prapanchas, prapanchat, they prapanchat, these uh, Fabrications, these uh, karma and klesha afflictions uh, come from prapancha, from fabrication, and the fabrications diminish in shunyata. Te shunyatayam nirudhyate. So, the very purpose of uh, exploration of the world is uh, not something to gain a knowledge and then produce something out of that, but to bring transformation within ourselves. Because the way we live, the moment we open our eyes, the way, the moment we start to think, it is simply reflection to the external world that we perceive. So our perception needs to be right. And I, our perception needs to be the, to perceive the world as it is. That is the very objective of all the, you know, uh, the Ind Indian philosophical schools. I'm just giving one example of Buddhism. Because there are many, you know, differences in views, but the approach and the direction is same. So once we have a right perspective, then rest of the things are channelized properly. That is the idea. Because in, in Buddhism and also in other you know, Indian philosophical schools, darshan and drishti, many people think that these two are similar, but they are very different. You know? If you study darshan and contemplate it and then imbibe it, or bring transformation, then your drishti will change. If you have a proper drishti, then you can behave properly according to your drishti. So this is a very important kind of uh, agenda of uh, the Indian philosophical you know, study, that we need to change our perception, how we look at things. That is why Buddhism is interested in, uh, Buddhism and other schools are interested in understanding the nature of the atom. It is not for the you know, purpose of making atom bum, but to explore that kind of uh, the strong, refining notion that we have. To destroy that, that is why in Buddhism you can find the hallmark of Buddhist study and Buddhist philosophy is deconstruction of reification, deconstruction of our, you know, refining nature, the way we look at the world as a refined 
entity. Right from very beginning, this has been the you know the the, the exercise. There are schools in Buddhism because all the schools have a different levels of understanding of reality, the nature of reality. Some schools subscribe to the idea that the atoms are the ultimate nature and they are indivisible. They are the ultimate unit of the entity, the material form. So far, so far as uh, the, you know, the 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 uh, atom is concerned, but the entities composed and produced by the uh, these atoms, they are designated, they are imputed, they don't go beyond that. So that is why in Buddhism there is a very strong notion of uh, nairatmya, selflessness. The Shravaka schools, the two lower schools, Vaibhashika and uh, Sautantrikas, they subscribe to the selflessness of person, just simply to the person. But uh, the upper schools, the Mahayana schools, Vijnanavada and uh, Madhimika, they oppose to the, the concept of uh, atom being indivisible and uh, substantial final unit of uh, the material world. They attacked, they refuted their ideas and went to the, that state, that uh, atom, subatomic level, and it went to that level where atoms get dissolved. You won't find anything. Nothing can be found at that level. So what remains? Nothing remains. Nothing remains in the sense of a substantial kind of nature of that entity. That is not there. That is the Shunyata. Shunyata of substantiality, Shunyata of uh, inherent existence. That is, uh, many people feel that, uh, you know, the Shunyata of uh, Ghatra, Shunyata of uh, Padra, that is not acceptable. The, the Madhimaka is not proposing the, the emptiness of that very stuff. It is proposing the emptiness of that substantiality substantial entity, substantial nature of that, you know, the, 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 the entity and up to the level of atomic, uh, you know, uh, nature. So when it dissolves, then what remains? But it does not, you know, negate the very existence of a gutter. For example, right, the gut is there, which is uh, conventionally applicable, observable, usable, but at, from the ultimate reality perspective that does not exist. And that is because we normally reify these entities. The, even the gut is reified. And then when we go deeper into the level of atom, just as the Sautantrikas do that, then at that level, so then, because can deconstruct the reification at the level of gut itself, but not at the level of atom. So Madhimikas go further, going into that level of atomic and subatomic level, and then deconstructs the reification of that level, that entity, that subtle entity. But the conventional, that is why in Buddhism, one of my very uh, respected friend, uh, uh, Professor Other Zines, uh, the um, a physicist, renowned, renowned physicist, and he, he had been a chairperson of uh, Mind and Life also. We used to go to each other's classrooms to teach. In physics, I used to go there, and in 
uh, Buddhist philosophy when I was uh, teaching at Amherst, then he, he used to come and uh, teach. We, you know, collectively, jointly uh, give, uh, uh, take uh, classes on philosophy and science. He used to say that in Buddhism you have two, the, 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 the system of two truths. That is very helpful. Whereas in science and phys physics, we, have, we don't have that. When it goes to that level and dissolves, that sometimes becomes difficult to accept the you know, existence of the entity, either gut or particle itself. So the very idea, as I have been saying that, the very idea of, perhaps my watch has stopped here. So what, what is the time, please? Okay, I, I must, because it stopped at... Uh, okay, so, um, so the very purpose, as I mentioned, is to bring transformation within ourselves. And uh, as Acharya Nagarjuna says that uh, all the kleshas, the karmas, whatever suffering we, you know, have is out of kleshas, the afflictive mind. And the afflictive mind is responsible for the behaviors, the actions that we, you know, uh, enact, perform. So in order to address it from the very fundamental level, we need to, you know, address it to change the very perception, and then, you know, subsequently change our behavior and then come out of the suffering. That is the whole agenda and objective of Indian civilizational kind of the exercise. So with these things, uh, uh, words, I would like to uh, end my uh, note. And I thank you for um, inviting me here. And I really appreciate Tibet House uh, uh, the the um, endeavor to conduct these kind of uh, conferences and workshops uh, quite often, and also I appreciate uh, with the very limited resource people, they run uh, uh, very comprehensive and uh, uh, major courses like a master's uh, course in uh, Nalanda tradition and things like that. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Keshava Samdila. And now I would like to request Dr. Sumit Kumar Mishraji to kindly address the gathering. Before I uh, pass the mic over to him, I would like to share the brief introduction about him as well. Dr. Mishra did his MSc in physics from Lucknow University, followed by MTech in atmospheric physics from the Pune University and in an Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology Pune and PhD in civil engineering specialization in environmental engineer at IIT Kanpur. Dr. Mishra is the principal scientist in National Physical Laboratory in Delhi, and he has worked as a visit visiting researcher in the de Department of Network and Computer Engineering, Tokai University in Japan in 2006. He availed the prestigious fellowship in 2020. 20 2012 to 13, and worked at, worked with Professor V. Ramanathan in Institution of Oceanography, University of California, San Diego, United States. Thank you, and please kindly. Thank you uh, for the introduction. So, uh, respected Professor G. N. Samton G., Vice Chancellor, Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies, Sarnath Varanasi. Professor Sishir Rai Ji from National Institute of Advanced Studies, uh, Bangalore, Mr. Tenjin Chogdan Ji, Secretary of Tibet House, New Delhi, and dear audience, I feel honored to express my views here, although I'm not the expert of the topic which is going to be brainstormed today, but uh, I will try to touch on the scientific and philosophical facets related to this. So I start with a quote uh, by a physicist, uh, Heisenberg, which is a German physicist, he says, after the conversations about Indian philosophy, some of the ideas of quantum physics that had seemed to that had seemed so crazy suddenly made much more sense. 
So the science of yoga and meditation does not fit into the western paradigm of reductionist science. However, the recent quantum physics of holism can and does fit into it eminently. In fact, quantum physics has come very close to the ancient Indian philosophy. German physicist H. P. Durr, who enunciated the duality principle in quantum physics, feels that he is just playing the second fiddle to the ancient Indian sages who have recognized a duality in form of Advaita. Dr. John Burroughs writes in his classical paper titled as Myths of Science, as many scientists do not seek to find the relationship between the individual components of a system, which is very imperative. Until unless we understand the individual compartment, we cannot come up with the uh, whole uh, physics of the system. So instead, they dissect things into smaller and smaller units. This way of perceiving the world has been called Newtonism or reductionism. All things exist in relationship to other things. Many scientists attempt to disconnect from these relationships and prefer to observe the world from a mechanistic viewpoint. The understanding of only compartment does not make the researcher understand the interconnections of various components in the whole system. Me as a climate scientist, if I look atmosphere, ocean, cryosphere, all different facets, I cannot come up to a real assessment of the climate change assessment until unless we integrate in different climate, different models like model, atmospheric model, the ocean model, until unless these models are coupled, nothing can be tell, told precisely in terms of climate change assessment. So the Indian philosophy is to look the in a, in a holistic way. The consciousness is the energy that flows as waves and is not seen or felt as particles and the same has not been comprehended by many scientists even today. The father of quantum physics, Max Planck, however, had realized that consciousness, consciousness is fundamental, even matter gets derived from the consciousness. We all know that the universe comprises of materials and non-materials, that is, living beings. Their energies are in various uh, quantized energy levels, sub-levels in the energy clusters. For being life, for the living being, the two zero states, that's the birth and the death cycle and spread blueprints are observed from which the energy is distinguished to be bright and dark energies. Principally, the bright and dark energies are the entangled and orthogonal quantities. The bright and dark spread signals can be controlled by keeping the bright spread signal always larger than that of the uh, dark energy. And when the dark energy enhances, that gives rise to suffering. The spread is formed by the energy signal oscillating with time, which is called soul, where the stopping spreading spread with time is called mind. The spread can be kept at rest by consideration of being dead, which is method of four mindfulness foundation, that is mindfulness of body, mindfulness of feelings, mindfulness of mind and mindfulness of Dhamma. The four noble truths comprise the essence of Lord Buddha's teaching, that is the truth of suffering, the truth of the cause of suffering, the truth of the end of suffering and the truth, truth of the path that leads to the end of suffering. According to the Lord Buddha, the only way to eradicate human anguish or suffering is to remove the attachment, the craving of our mind towards this physical system, towards from various uh, objects or concepts to which we are attached. From the Buddha history in the Tipitaka book, there were three practical ways the Lord Buddha has gone through before reaching the enlightenment. The first one is Spirit oscillation time control by meditation. Second, bright and dark spirit signal con uh, conversions by dry tree. And the third is spirit energy control by four mindfulness foundation which I discussed earlier. The brain performance could be increased and can be reached to the state of unlimited brain performance which is expressed as the ratio of S by P. S is the pure mind signal and P is our passion signal. If as Sir has already briefed, we, we detach ourselves from these the physical charms and when it P tends to D zero, then it gives rise to one upon zero that gives rise to infinite. The brain performance tends to infinity. That gives the uh, 
a kind of enli- enlightenment now i don't want to take for the more time on uh, these things uh, because i am not really the expert and it would not be a justice to look in so and i don't want to be work uh, working as a barrier between you and professor sishir rai who is well known quantum physics expert and uh, uh, i had heard i was fortunate to hear him many times so uh, with this i am closing my words with a quote on rigveda na o bhadra kritvo yantu vishyata let noble thoughts come to us from all and every direction in the universe because here we are assembling to discuss various facets of the regimes lying in the science and spiritually spirituality so uh, i think there are various sessions which are planned today in, in different uh, sessions i had gone through the topic so it's really interesting and uh, i wish uh, that it should go uh, i mean very go very nice thank you thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much professor sumit kumar mishra ji and now i would like to request professor sisi roy ji to kindly address the gathering and also before i proceed uh, i request professor sisi i would like to share a brief introduction of him as well uh, professor sisi roy a theoretical physicist is currently working as a phys- visiting professor and a senior homi baba fellowship at uh, national institute of advanced studies bangalore He worked as a professor in physics and applied mathematics in unit in the Statistical Institute Kolkata. Professor Sisi Roy published more than 250 papers in international journal and published 16 research monograph and edited volumes of Kluwer Kluwer Academic Springer World Scientific etc. and his main field of interest include foundation of quantum theory, cosmology, brain function modeling and uh, consciousness his recent book include uh, demystifying the akasha quantum vacuum and consciousness in new york 2011 and he has published various books and um, various papers and uh, before without taking much time i would like to minimize it and proceed to you so Uh, respected professor shamtan ji and uh, who is the chief guest professor sumit kumar mishra from npl is the guest of honor and my learned colleagues scientists and philosophers we have arranged uh, many many conferences and even uh, his holiness also arrange with the collaboration of mind and life institute many dialogues among the scientists and philosophers but the one particular things which haunted me i mean many of my students and other serious researchers in special in physics they had a long query like uh, well why do we discuss philosophy because what kind of benefit you can get it so that we can spend time this is the yeah this is the questions coming up and unless we can give some insights or some thoughts in this issue it's very difficult to get the serious young minds who are deeply in, uh, involved in scientific research even not in india i mean if you look at the world perspective then uh, this kind of debate has arisen already so the question is does science need philosophy at all one of the uh, greatest physicist in 20th century stephen weinberg of course he passed away maybe 6 months or one year before he is from usa he won nobel prize so he made a remarkable statement he argues that philosophy is no more is more damaging than helpful for physics although it might provide some good ideas at times it is often a straight jacket that physicists have to free themselves from he is very very influential physicist not only in usa but all over the world 
more radically another great physicist stephen hawking who is also no more with us stephen hawking wrote philosophy of dead because the big questions that used to be discussed by the philosophers are now in the hands of physicists well <laughs> this is very very uh, big statements and both of them are very influential oh, St stephen weinberg who wrote his, uh, the this book dreams of final theory i mean they tried to understand a theory which is called theory of everything so that it can explain all entities in the in this physical universe whether i mean it was einstein's dream and he told that physicist whether they can really construct such kind of theory now the main issue is regarding methodology of science and methodology of the you know the philosophy in, in various schools of indian even indian philosophy so if you try to understand what is the methodology of science and what is the methodology of philosophy itself so methodology of science in a single sentence called empiricism and a currently common description of what scientists do the one we learn today at school or college is collecting data from observation experiments and measurements and making sense of them in the form of theories so the relationship between data and theory is very very complex and far from being uncontroversial since it's not at all obvious how we can make a theory out of the data it's very complex and nobody knows the clear path that starting from a data how can you build up a theory but now if you look at the uh, different schools of philosophy itself this is called introspection like uh, we observe certain entities or certain things happening in the world and then uh, in philosophy what they say that we use our sensory organs and through experience we get something but in science in general this is not true what we use we use instruments sensory organs and then we try to interpret so we don't know what is the role of the instruments or which kind of philosophical school they talked about instruments what is their characteristics and what is their usefulness so there is methodological differences between science and philosophy one uh, very interesting work was published recently by theoretical physicist his name is carlo rovelli he made another different statements he told that those who deny the utility of philosophy are doing philosophy in writing things like philosophy is useless to physics or philosophy is dead they are not doing physics so what they are doing they were reflecting on the best way to develop science so the issue here is the methodology of science a central concern in the philosophy of science is of course precisely to ask how science is done and how it could be done to be more effective so good scientists do reflect on their own methodology and it is quite appropriate that weinberg and hawking have done so too uh, because time is very less for me it's 10 minutes and it's very difficult to say uh, i can say there are two aspects of the issues one is relevance of philosophy to science in the past and now the questions of whether philosophy has become irrelevant in the present day science because in past many many of us they give references to heisenberg not only heisenberg eddington einstein max planck but now people like stephen weinberg 
or Hawking, they said now because of the advancements of technology, we have collected lots and lots of data. So uh, we, we do not really uh, to study more on philosophy or we have to investigate, investigate what is there in philosophy. So there is a debate going on, but we have something in our mind which I, I can expose it here. Okay, what is that? Like before going to that, what is the current debates going on or which kind of topics in modern science or especially modern physics is going on? One of the issues is what is space itself? This in, in, in philosophy called Indian philosophy called this. What is time? Is Kal. What is the then? Uh, is the world deterministic? I mean, do you need to take observer into account to describe nature? E even uh, when, when uh, Professor uh, Samtenji, he was referring Mulo Madhuman Karika in, in the Nagarjun's, the great book, there is one chapter, maybe 17 chapter, where he discussed about Kalo, or time itself. So time is very much important issue in modern science. So, I mean, the issue regarding time is what is the ontology of time, what is the ontology of space, and ontology means kind of substratum which cannot be reduced further on, irreducible. So these are the issue. Now it is a debated even in theoretical physics, not even in philosophical perspective, but uh, there are some issues like uh, in 21st century physics. For example, the scientists, they discover that there exists a kind of very small scale called small scale of length called Planck scale or small scale of time called Planck time. How scientists discover this? Scientist uses the numerical value of Planck constant, which is one of the fundamental constant, speed of light, another fundamental constant and gravitation constant. Out of these three fundamental constant and using dimensional analysis, they found a smallest scale of length called Planck scale. What is the dimension? 10 to the power minus 33 centimeter. Well, we cannot visualize, I cannot visualize what is 10 to the power minus 33 centimeter because every life is kilometer, meter, or centimeter or millimeter length, but it is 10 to the power minus 33 centimeter. This is the smallest scale of length. What is the smallest scale of time called Planck time? What is that? 10 to the power minus 43 second. Well, this is another very, very small number and we cannot visualize in our sensory perception. Why these are so important? Because if you look the smallest scale of length, it means below that length, there is no concept of space, no concept of time, or no concept of causation. So the issue is how uh, in everyday life, we have concept of space, we have concept of time, we have concept of causations. So issue is how from a substratum, where there is no concept of space, no concept of time, no concept of causation. So how from a substratum without these things we are getting or the concept like space, time and causation emerges. This is called ontological issues. And these ontological issues, this is, I mean, haunting the physicists, not from philosophical side, even from physics point of view. And uh, people are uh, proposing, I mean, it's not in science, even in philosophy. There, are, uh, there is a uh, concept called Gedanken experiments in German. In English, it's called thought experiments. So what they do, they propose kind of experiments which, uh, which may not, I mean, they think that it, it may be done in the laboratory, but in the onset, they don't think that whether it is Done, it can be done in lab or not. So they propose some kind of thought experiment, which are very, very important, even to understand 
these kind of issues. So these type of thought experiments are many, many in uh, philosophy also, philosophy, social science, not only physics. Like uh, one very well-known issue is Plato's cave. I mean, a set of prisoners are facing the wall. I mean, they are putting in such a way that they can look into the wall itself. And uh, because of the light, they will see the shadows uh, on the wall. So for them, I mean, they are they are for years after years. So for them, reality is like shadows. So uh, this is Plato's prisoners. The issue is what is reality? Similar thought experiments also people do in physics also. Like Schrodinger himself proposed a cat experiment called Schrodinger cat or Wigner, Einstein's, many, many great scientists or even Galileo. They initially uh, put some thought experiment and later uh, scientists tried to understand through lab experiments. Similarly, in Buddhist philosophy, there is one very famous thought experiment called Payashi Sukta. I mean, uh, the events of Payashi Sukta occur just after Buddha's Parinirmana and the distribution of his relics. It is a debate between the Prince Payashi and the Buddhist monk Kumaru, Kumaru Kasyam. So, uh, that prince, he used to say something which is against the core of Buddhist philosophy and then the monk, Buddhist monk, he tried to refute it. Like at that time, uh, people, uh, prince raised that you are saying that consciousness, quote unquote, I, I don't understand what is consciousness. Consciousness is there in a human body and the uh, body is placed in a closed jar. So he told after the death of the persons, you just wait before death and after death and you don't see any difference. So he refuted that consciousness exists in a body. This is kind of first kind of experiment. And if you look this kind of challenges by Prince uh, Payashi, then uh, you will immediately recognize he is just like a modern day scientist. But I don't know, maybe Professor Samtenji might tell whether that time they had a kind of notion of laboratory experiments. They used thought experiments, what we do here in science, but in science we do also lab experiments. Then comes uh, doctrine of true truths, what Samtenji told that conventional truth or ultimate truth, which is in Vedanta also we say Babaharik uh, Shatta and Paramarthik Shatta. But in physics, he rightly said, uh, we don't know. Yeah. We don't know uh, how to categorize the conventional truth and ultimate truth. Unless we can categorize it, it, it would be very difficult to have a dialogue between uh, the core philosophy of uh, Nagarjuna, that ultimate truth and conventional truth, with uh, the truth or layers of truth in physics like classical physics, classical reality, then quantum reality, etc. I don't have time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Sisiroi Ji. And now, before I conclude today's inaugural session, on behalf of Tibet House New Delhi, would like to thank especially our chief guest, Venerable Professor Kishan Awasamdila, our guest of honor, Professor Sumit Kumar Mishra Ji, and our keynote speaker, and to all the speakers for accepting the invitation in a very short period of time and gracing this occasion. Thank you very much and
Now we'll starting our first session in five minutes, so please be seated. And with uh, the first session is on quantum cognition and the concept of free will in Buddhism versus logic and excluded middle, and evolution of the principle of causality from an antiquity to its relevance to quantum physics versus two truths with emphasis on emptiness as the foundation of all the existences. And my colleague, Mr. Legmila, will be moderating first session. Thank you very much.